In our last lecture, we talked about backpropagation, which is the algorithm that neural networks use to learn the weights and biases that allow the model to best predict the data. In this lecture, we're going to go over an example of backpropagation applied to the real problem of recognizing handwritten digits. MNIST is a data set of images of handwritten digits for digits 0 to 9, all labeled with their corresponding number. This data set has 60,000 training examples and 10,000 test examples. It's kind of like a hello world problem for machine learning, and results on this task have been published for a wide range of models, so you can always benchmark your results against the results of published models. Unsurprisingly, deep learning models have had some of the best results on this task. The challenge for this task is that the same digit can look very different when it's written with different handwriting, and also the digits can be rotated and offset, etc. Each image of a digit is a 28 by 28 pixel black and white image with grayscale values representing the pixel darkness. Because it's a 28 by 28 pixel image, this means our input has 28 times 28, which is 784 values. So it is a 784 dimensional input. For our example, let's look at a fully connected neural network with two hidden layers and an output layer. Hidden layer one has six neurons. Hidden layer two has eight neurons. And our final output layer has 10 neurons. Each neuron in the output layer will represent the detection of digits 0 to 9. So we're going to call these output neurons neuron 0 to neuron 9. And this produces a 10-dimensional output. The outputs of each of the neurons in the output layer will be a probability value. So each neuron will output a value of a number between 0 and 1 that represents how likely the network thinks that the input data is the corresponding digit. So this means what we want the network to do is when it's presented with an image of this number 3, we want the third neuron to output a probability of 1 and the rest of the neurons to output a probability of 0. If this network is presented with this image of a 5, we want the fifth neuron to output a probability 1 and the rest of the neurons to output a probability 0. If we show the network this image of a 9, again, we want the ninth neuron to give a 1 and the rest a 0. And if we show the network a 1, we want this neuron to output a 1 and the rest to be 0, and so on. Let's look at what one step of backpropagation looks like for this example. Say we're starting with initially randomized weights and biases. So our network has not learned anything yet. We assemble our set of training data, and we present our first piece of training to the network. And this is the image of a 6. We see what our network outputs. Because the weights and biases are random right now, our network is not going to output anything sensible. But we need to keep track of the error. The network outputs 10-dimensional outputs because it has 10 output neurons, and each output neuron is representing the detection of one of the digits 0 to 9. So the error for our network's response to an image of a 6 is the sum of the errors of all our output neurons. This means we're calculating the squared difference for all our output neurons of the difference between the current prediction our network is outputting and what it should output, which is a 1 for neuron 6 and a 0 for all the other neurons. The sum of the squared difference between what our model is predicting right now and what the model actually should be giving for all neurons gives us the error for our network in response to this one piece of training data. We then have to repeat this for all our training data. 
so that for all pieces of training data, we repeat this error calculation by summing the squared error over all our output neurons for the difference between what we want our network's output to be and what the actual output currently is. Averaging this error over all training data gives us the value for the cost function for the current values of weights and biases in our network. Now it's time to do backpropagation with the chain rule. This means we're going to update weights and biases starting from the output layer and working backwards from there through the hidden layers. First, we calculate the gradient of the cost function with respect to the weights and biases of the output layer. And we update these in accordance to the negative gradient. This change in weights and biases should change the output to be closer to the actual answer that we want. The cost function should now decrease. We next move backwards along the network and we want to update the weights and biases for the second hidden layer. Using the chain rule, we calculate the gradient of the change in cost with respect to the weights and biases of the second hidden layer, and we use this gradient to update the weights and biases of the second hidden layer. The adjustments to the second layer weights and biases should be changing the output of the second hidden layer, such that when they are fed into the output layer neurons, the ultimate output from the network will be nudged closer to the answer that we want for all the data in our training set. The cost function should now decrease. So every time the cost reduces, the weights and biases will have nudged in a way such that the outputs of each layer are causing the outputs of the next layer to cause the final output of our network to be closer to the actual answer which is a 1 for the digits that's being shown and a 0 for all the other neurons corresponding to the digits not being shown. Let's see what it looks like to update the weights and biases for our first hidden layer. Again, we calculate the gradient with respect to the weights and biases of the first hidden layer. And this tells us how to change the weights and biases for all the neurons in the first hidden layer such that the output, which becomes the input to the second hidden layer, will cause the second hidden layer neurons to produce outputs that get fed as inputs to the output layer neurons, which then will produce ultimate outputs from our network that are closer to the answers that we want for all the data in our training set. And this is one learning step of backpropagation. And we'd repeat this over and over until our output neurons are as close as they can be to getting the correct answer, which is predicting the digit that it's seeing for all the digits in our training set. Even though I've highlighted the importance of calculating the cost by averaging over the errors for all the examples in our training set, in reality, there are different ways for how we would use the data because sometimes we actually only update the gradient for a single training example, and this is known as stochastic gradient descent. We've now seen an example of how backpropagation can be used to update the parameters of a neural network. In practice, deep learning practitioners often use variations on the backpropagation algorithm, but the main idea remains the same.